still call him Frozen Fritz. Mm. Well, they would, wouldn't they? Yeah. Well, the Yanks are all a bit dopey anyway, aren't they? <laughs> hey, I hope I hope our blooming uh, Kate's not watching. <laughs> you you seem, to, you seem to upset her every week, uh, Pete. <laughs> That's not difficult. Well, the, th the thing is, the only person who's capable of being president of the United States is Donald Trump. <laughs> he gets on well with Putin, doesn't he? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, and let's not talk about let's not talk about um, that border dispute in Ukraine. It's just uh, I don't think okay. we will do that today. Um, and uh, right, I, I, I I've just been to Odessa. It's very nice there. Well, what with Donald Trump? <laughs> you went with Donald Trump, did you? And he's come. And he's gonna back out, and he's come back in again. Right, everything's yeah, ready to go. Right, okay, we're 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 ready to go now. Right, so okay, let's do let's do news of the week. Right, news of the week. Um, let, let's do. Right, okay, uh, uh, let's start with uh, Anne. Anything you want to tell us this week, Anne? It's uh, <laughs> we we we're, we're straight on it. No, no, I've got nothing to me. Sorry. Right. Okay, Pete's going to tell us the uh, the latest with the Flat Owl Society. Go on, Pete, because he's just had a meeting and he's just oh. been flirting with all the women. Go on, Pete. <laughs> go for it. Well, we just had a meeting saying we've had some successful what's name, but and they're training oh, new. You've had some guys. successful what's the name? What? That's disgusting. They what? had a successful working weekend. Oh no, they've been over there. Yes, oh yes. Oh right, brilliant. Yep. Go on. Well, they did quite a bit of painting, did quite a bit of maintenance in the uh, farmhouse. We've got a new morden now starting over there, Simon. And they've uh, that, that graded his uh, flat above the farmhouse for him. Good. And it's all coming back quite nicely. All uh, right. Okay. So 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 the uh, fake demic didn't do much much damage to the island then. Thankfully, no. Right, okay, that's good, that's good. When you're going out there next, Pete, let us know. Yeah, yeah, I don't know when I'll get out there again, because... Uh, okay. Various uh, things. I know, Pete, I know, I know. Right, any latest from Sandra? <clears throat> no, no, I haven't heard from Sandra. I should bring her, I haven't. Okay, okay, please please keep, please give her yeah. our, our love. Yes, I, I will, every time I speak to her, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Right, okay, uh, right. So what we need to hear from now, the one who's got some really uh, interesting news, right, other than Pete, naturally, um, is is Pat. Uh, Pat, tell us a little bit more other than what you've just told us, other than the fact that you didn't kiss any fairies. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I found something really old, prehistoric, Go on. Go in on. the Manx Museum. You know, there are a lot yes. of Viking stuff and Viking hordes and other stuff, but um, let's see if I put this up. Uh, let's see. Oh, full on screen. Go on, let's have it. It's a big stone. Yeah, go on. Is there? Right. So you know how big it is. Mm, no, right. put a side on. Put a side on. Put a side on the screen. Side on. Side on. No, no, no. Side. If you put, if you move your phone side on, we can get it all onto the horizontal. Oh, yes. Horizontal. <laughs> right, put, it, put, it, put it back <laughs> away from you. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, can you see there? What is it? Yeah. Go on, tell us what it okay, is. Okay, it's got that big round hole, and then all those other cups, you know. It's like a oh, gaming like, thing, doesn't it? You know, it's prehistoric, but um, it had been reused several times by different generations and different peoples, you know. Nice. So I can't tell for sure what it was because they yes. don't start out just like that. It just ended Did up. The Vikings used as a speaker stone. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Ah, yep. Ah, uh, yes. But Peter the and his person speaker. who held the stone. Did the mm -hmm. speaking, then you pass it on to the next person. Well, this one you can't pick up. <laughs> that was my foot at the bottom of the picture. <laughs> it was huge. Were yes. you ever at that meeting that we had, and we we handed around a, a, a human femur to to use as a speaking stone? Did were you ever at that meeting? No, I missed that. <laughs> no, I, I I think the people who went to it missed it as well. But okay, I, I, thanks for that. And um, how long were you there? You were there for a week. Um, well, um, four nights. Four nights. Right. Yeah, three right. days. Yeah, yeah. Okay. On yeah. this on this moment, right, whilst we got you, Pat, it's just me and you, nobody else is here. <laughs> um, I was going through the old press cuttings and uh Margaret mentioned this and uh it's Mesolithic dwelling unearthed at Isle of Man Airport. 
Oh. Um, because Margaret's the only one who listens, listens to my lectures and she <laughs> remembers it all. Um, a well-built sheltered, a, a well-built shelter found at uh, Ronald's Way, uh, not to be confused with Ronaldsley, as in Orkney, but Ronald's Way, in the path of a planned extension to the Isle of Man's airport, as astonished archaeologists by yielding carbon dates, radiocarbon dates, that place it squarely in the Mesolithic period. Mm, nice. Um, Manx National Heritage commented that archaeologists hesitate to call a structure of this kind a house uh, because the received wisdom is that 8,000 years ago, people constantly moved through the landscape as nomads gathering their food from the land rather than staying put and farming and harvesting it. But this building was constructed from substantial pieces of timber and had a hearth for cooking and warmth. So therefore, Ooh. definitely a building in the Mesolithic period. Mm, nice, like it. Yeah. Um, surrounding the structure, archaeologists from Oxford Archaeology North found over 12,001 pieces of work flint together with the tools needed to flake them and food debris in the form of hundreds of hazelnut shells. This suggests this suggestion says that the occupants lived here for a prolonged period and or visited the site at regular intervals. Finally, Oxford archaeology has also found the remains of Bronze Age village, three burials and numerous artefacts at the same site, which was already known to be unusually rich in prehistoric and historic landscape remains when the Air island airport was constructed here in 1939. And they know Lloyd George visited there because he found a statue associated with him. <laughs> right, there you go. Excellent. Thank you. Anything else you want to say about the, uh, the Isle of Man, Pat, before we move on? No, nope, that's fine. Thank you very much. OK, who else have we got now? Uh, we've got David. No, thank you. Thank you very much, David. Um, Margaret, who's, who, who, who isn't going to be short and sweet. Go on, Margaret, tell us no, a bit more. No, nothing, nothing this week. Margaret, you may as well just leave the class then. I know. I know, I know. Oh, Margaret, this class would not be the same without you. We, we, on behalf of all the Adams and Peters, we really appreciate you and David. We really appreciate you taking part in our classes. Um, right, OK, who else have we got? Now, one of the, one of the Adams. <laughs> Peter, whoever speaks first Peter. is Adam. Got no news. Right, okay, that's definitely an Adam. You can tell. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Uh, right, uh, one of the three Peters. No, the <laughs> other Peter. Oh, God, go on. Uh, uh, Peter, oh. Yeah, I got, so, I got something. Um, uh, it's go HS, HS2 again. Go on. Um, they found <laughs> a Mesolithic uh, <laughs> hammer. Is that what they're called? Hammer, yeah, yeah, it's hammer. It's a, but it's made out of like a, a, a beach or a river cobble. Um, but they found it. They, were, they said it was part of a, a. There was a medieval quarry cut, or spoil. Sorry, medieval spoil heap. And then in the spoil heap, they found a a, a, a ditch cut, which they reckon is a Bronze Age bell barrow ditch or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's other Bronze Age barrows in the area, but then the, the Mesolithic hammer was in the Bronze Age ditch. Ah. So that's very interesting because um, as I gave you that demonstration the other week, just, be, just because you find certain things in certain archaeology doesn't mean that, that certain <laughs> stuff actually dates that layer. Mm -hmm. Um and that's a, obviously it's ended up in there because some soil was moved or something. Really interesting, really interesting thing there. I like that. Rabbits. Rabbits. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, was a hole? Was a hole in this um, pebble? Yeah. It what it had been? What they call it? Peck, pecked out. Yeah. So um, rather than drilled out, but it it um, it had somewhere on both sides, so it had been used. Um, yeah, yeah. And there was evidence that it had been. Half hafted is that the word? Yeah, there there would be mounted on a um, yeah yeah. Shaft. yeah yeah yeah. I did wonder if it was an heirloom. Ah. you never know. You never you never know. Or or, or or it could have been used as a loom weight or anything like that. Yeah you know, yeah so absolutely yeah. yeah 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 yeah. Um oh oh yeah as in handed down the generations heirloom oh, right. yeah. Maybe not all the way, but surely Bronze Age people were more likely to find Mesolithic finds than we are today. And actually, actually, right, 
you've just made a really interesting point. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 <clears throat> Very interesting point that you've just made um, is that obviously the Bronze Age people are closer to the Mesolithic pe people than us, and there would be more of a connection with the Mesolithic people than we have today because there's thousands of years distance. Um, and it goes back to it goes back to um, I think the writings of, of Geoffrey of, of Monmouth when he writes about Chilean, when he writes about the vaulting of the Roman bath still standing at Chilean. Um, in about the 1100s and you're starting to think well obviously he was connected to the Roman period closer than we are today and 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 that is something that we seem to forget and it's a very interesting point and I would like that remembered and brought up in in other points that that we use when we look at when we do archaeology and we look at other topics and and one of, one of, the, one of the other issues there is is that when we think of barrow diggers um, and, you know, I know we take a, the Michael a couple of times here and there, but it's a very serious issue. And uh, when we think about the barrow diggers, they, they're 150, 200 years closer to the past than we are. So obviously there's going to be more available to them than us. And we can blame them for what's happening. But then again, when we think about when we think about the work of um, uh, Graham Clark, when he's working at Star Car in the late 1940s, how much of that would be there today? How much of that could still be there today? Maybe, maybe the wood that was found at Star Car uh, in the past 70 years has actually rotted away. So it was good that he excavated it when he did. Um, if Scarabray hadn't have been realized when it was in 1850, Scarabray would no longer exist. So all of these connections with the past are very <clears throat> important to see them in the moment rather than forget about the importance of that moment. Good point there, Peter. Right, and finally, Adam, uh, Andy. Adam, Andy, do you want to be on Adam? Right, go on. We can't hear you, Adam. Andy, oh God, no, stop it. I'll, I'll go Adam, for Andy. Andy. I'm Andy. Oh, okay, just <laughs> keep it simple. Please, <laughs> sorry. sorry. No, I'd, I'd, I'd switched it off because it was eating and I'd forgotten. Um, I, um, I watched the programme on... Uh, a find of a fossilized remains of a humanoid that um, I think Margaret might have mentioned a few weeks ago that in South Africa that was two and a half million years old. Right. Uh, and they haven't worked out where it fits into our history yet. It's not part of the humanoid, as in Homo sapiens sapien line with <clears> all <throat> the other one incorporated. They are what, five different people there. It's before that. So they're not right. sure whether oh, no, it relates. It was Anne. Anne saw that. Uh, oh, Anne, was it Anne? Anne saw it. Yes, Anne, yes, Anne, Anne, Anne sorry, it. Anne. Yeah, it was a yeah. really interesting program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that they're they're, they're exam yeah they're examining it. They managed to get you know three quarters of a skeleton out of it. Well, a man and a woman, and they know there's another one there as well, um, which was really interesting in this little cave in South Africa. Ah, yeah. um, uh, is is this the cave associated with the San people? Uh, could be. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, is that the one that they found evidence of some of the earliest fire uh, burning, uh, the earliest fire? Is that the one? Uh, not sure how much they've dug out of that. They got some saber toothed tigers and all sorts of things out of there as well. It was a pit that they think that uh, because there was not a lot of water around and there was, they think there was water in the bottom of it, that they've been climbing into it to get to the water and fallen in because the, the, the boy who I think was something like 12 had broken both his arms right at the top. Uh, and that they, they said that there's only one way that happens, and that's when you're trying to break your fall from a great height. Mm. Yeah, so, but, oh, uh, God, sorry to hear that. But yeah. yeah, but, well, he wouldn't have been there. They, they think, they, you know, once he was there, then there was a flash flood and a lot of sediment flooding it, and then he just got compacted in that, and that's what saved him and, and for us. So it, it's, it's absolutely astonishing. You know, they, they reconstructed his face, mm. you know. So. Wow. But poor, poor bugger. Do you, you really think? Yeah, you no, know, it's just a weird, weird, really weird concept, isn't it? Immortalization by by a fall. Yeah, yeah. You know. But I also wondered. I thought, yeah. you know, they, they haven't got a great deal of information to go on on facial reconstructions on that, have they? So they kind of they average things from other bits and pieces, and thinking, well, that's not really very accurate, is it? It's better than nothing, perhaps. But <clears> it could be. It could have looked completely different, you know. But, but anyway, but yeah, but two and a half million years old, astonishing. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. 
Do you think he could have had a moustache like Hitler? Well, he could have done. You never know. He could have been the first. (laughs) Why like Hitler? (laughs) (laughs) Why not? (laughs) I wish I'd have said anything. All right. Okay. Thank you for that, Andy. Maybe not at 12. Maybe his mum did. (laughs) Yeah. What? Right, okay. That's... Don't be sexist. Is it wispy? Right, okay. Women are allowed to have moustaches as well. Absolutely. Don't In a box. In a box. Women can have hairs <laughs> under their armpits. Right, let's move on. Um... Yeah, fascinating programme there. I couldn't believe it. And how carefully that took the lady who, who cut the stone away from the, from the bone. It took mm. her something like four or five months just to do the skull. You know. Is it on catch up? Will I, I be able it, to I think it? it was on one of the National Geographic channels. Oh no, I don't get that. Yeah. <clears throat> you can occasionally type the stuff into YouTube and get clips of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, possibly. Yeah. yeah. So um anyway, gr- brilliant. Yeah. Anyway, really appreciate that, Andy. Thank you. So um I I've, I do believe, hang on a minute. Good. I, I don't I hopefully I'm not accidentally muted anybody. Um can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Right. So, um, obviously, I had a little list in my diary, and it said, "Right, a couple of you want to know a little bit more about Stanton Moor and habitation." So I, I just thought, right, I'll I'll try and um, I'll, I'll try and put a little bit of that in there. Um, also, we've got um, a couple of you want to know a little bit more about Rudston. Um, there, there was a little thing that some of you wanted to know a little bit more about Bellas Nap and the false portal and whether there's any false portals like that anywhere else in the country. And I'm, I'm really struggling to actually find any other examples other than um, other than sort of possible examples. So I might do a little bit about that. We've obviously got some other stuff that's actually come through up from Henry uh, that is actually takes part in on the Wednesday evenings. Uh, we've got the barrow diggers and uh, I've got a little bit about that that find in China as well. So um, whatever comes first up on the screen and um, and, and that's uh, none is not I don't think it's going to be in that order, by the way. Uh, but uh, let, let's just take, let's just get on to it. Um, and screen. And start now. And where are we? And. Right, okay, we just nearly had the Jeremy Clarkson stuff then. Right, gallery, good. Right, okay, so um, there we go. So what, what, what it basically was, it was a sort of, sort of um, a, a, a pseudo start on basically a, a little bit of, a little bit more information about Stanton, Stanton Moore. Um, and not firmly much in the way of not firmly much in the way of sort of habitation but one one of the things one of the things from this you can actually get a good idea of 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 the landscape that we were looking at in regards to Stanton Moor and it sort of discussed these words like uh, white peak dark peak so obviously the white peak is the limestone and the dark peak are the other types of stones from the landscape so obviously white being sort of the limestoney type um world um and what we've got is is lots of names of locations of key sites which we're not really going to go into any detail i just wanted to give you a little bit more detail but if we if we zoom in on there it sort of tells you where stanton moore is on the um right hand side um and uh that's that's at no not on the right hand side it's a 21 hang on a minute i've got my numbers wrong there 21 number 21 there you go 21 just under bakewell so there, there's there's where you have um stanton moor um and what you've got is is the names of sort of um you know various other sort of landscapes there's there's there's, there's lots of there's a what I'm trying to get at is is there's a rich prehistoric landscape and and we can only sort of think that when we looked at Stanton Moor and and 21 on on the image there, it is just part of a very much greater rich prehistoric landscape, a, a, a deep prehistoric landscape, and as I was just sort of going going through some of this material, 
Um, and I just basically thought, right, what is what is an unusual thing that might indicate uh, the likes of um, occupation and, and the likes of places where people lived? And the best way of actually doing that would be actually to look at this other chart, which is here. Uh, and this is this is actually a little chart here that is is relating to site names at the top of the screen, Casington Pasture. It says that there's a barrow there. It's in one of those white peak areas. And this is basically based upon pottery artifacts that have been found. So if you're looking for settlements that you're going to be interested in um, the pottery associated with the, those settlements. So across that, that big area of Derbyshire, the, these types Or at the bottom of the screen, Cotley uh, Moor and Wigburlow and Royston Grange, all these wonderful places. For example, at um, Harborough Rocks, it says that the settlement there, and it says you've got seven sherds being found there. Um, and that tells you that the sherds are from the early Bronze Age. So basically somewhere in a region of 4,300 years ago or somewhere like that. So so interesting that we that we've got pottery, lots of pottery, even at barrows. Barrows obviously must be related to some settlements in places. It's got different categories of of sites there, like defended settlements, a flat cemetery. Uh, a flat cemetery is basically a cemetery under the ground without barrows. We would presume a flat grave underneath underneath the ground rather than the barrow above the ground. So I thought that was rather interesting to sort of try to link in pottery. Uh, with some of these types of sites, barrows, settlements, defender settlements, and so on. And obviously then think um, by inference that, you know, that the pottery must have been associated with some kind of settlements nearby. And obviously some of these are marked as settlements within that great Derbyshire landscape. Another one of those images, again, uh, this, is a, this is another interesting one. So if I can get my uh, material up here, this is this is a sort of a geological map. Um, you can clearly see Bakewell, just sort of um, um, south southeast of, of Bakewell is 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 a Stanton Moor landscape. You can see that all the dark areas are the are the grits are, are the more more grits like the sandstone grits, the limestone there being a limestone plateau. Very interesting, very deep sort of, and within that landscape, you're going to get lots of different trees growing, um, different trees growing on um, gritstone moors like your sort of uh, maybe you've got your aspens and maybe you've got your um, Scots pine, and then your limestones you might get your ashes and you might get your oaks. And those types of trees. So obviously that's going to be really in, in, uh, important when you relate the landscape within Derbyshire to to what's going on, the activity, you know, the, the, the varied massive sense of activity that's going on across this landscape. And then the other image is something that we, we don't really look at a lot. This is actually um, um, photo micrographs of selected prehistoric pottery from the Peak District National Park landscape. And you can actually get an idea that you can identify the different types of pottery from the types of inclusions that are found in the clay. Um, and uh, um, I know this was a little bit of a... Um, um, trying to get you to think about the landscape a little bit bigger and to support put some more detail into it but an expert friend of mine called Stephen Clark who, who isn't very well at this minute he's one of the guys that used to be in time team love him to bits but he's not very well at this minute um Stephen Clark he, he he's um he, he, you can give him a bit of pottery he puts her under a, um, a lens and he can tell you exactly from the grit in the pottery where the clay originated from the grit in rich region and he can tell you where the pots were actually manufactured from the inclusions in the clay so basically the brown areas in here are basically the clay and the bits of grit in there right so obviously most of this is is the dark areas and the gritty areas um lots of this is is 
if you can probably probably see on I think on the one on the the left hand side at the bottom, uh, that's probably got some um, may, maybe a bit of sandstone um, grit a uh, grit in there, sort of um, what have you. But you can get from all this an idea where well, all that pottery for over time actually originated by looking at samples of pottery under the microscope. Um, so I just wanted to give that, just, just chuck that in there as a little bit of a taster um, to try and ask, answer one or two of those questions about the Derbyshire Stanton Moor landscape. Um, and guess what we're on next? We're on this. So straight straight onto barrow diggers next and i'm just going to give you an idea how many barrow digger images we've got these look at this it gives you a bit of a taste we've got this guy merryweather the ideal man for Anne. um and any guesses what this mound is here silvery uh, yes you are right and look at that there an original image what using early photography of silvery hill look at that isn't that great um and it's saying that that was, I can't imagine that, that image isn't taken in 1849, but you can get you can get an idea of the date there. Uh, that that's one of the sharp very weather shafts. We'll look at that when we when we go on to that. And some more images. And after that, we're going to look a little bit more about Rudston because there, there were some questions about Rudston. I've not got the cursor stuff about Rudston, but again, this is this is all part of me trying to sort of get loads of information into these lectures out there to try, try and be as varied and, and, uh, and as intense with the archaeology as possible. So this is where we are now. And please feel free if you've got any questions that crop up to sort of uh, bring this to us. Uh, but as, as you can see, the caption of this diggers or desecrators is the title today. Um, and I do apologize if um, you might have interference with my voice by the likes of the fact that we've we've got extremely heavy rain here, wind blowing and everything rocking around. Um, there, this caption is, there now, driven off again, and my men um, scattered. I am tired of this. I am black and blue all over <laughs> with hand thumps. I've been listening to it, so I've been listening to trying to do. Carl, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, it says, my daughter's come on trying to sort this out, and it came up that the host has disabled the par participant screen share. You know, I can't see the screen. I couldn't last week. Well, the, an the question, answer to that is, can you see the screen, Andy? Well, okay, his, his thingy magic is there. Adam, can you see the screen? Yes, sorry, yeah, I can see it, yeah. Yes, yeah. I can see it. Yes, I, I was the only one last week that couldn't see it. But right, okay. it's saying that it, this is what... okay. Okay, what I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm just going to come off here momentarily, right? And and see if we've got a bit of faff here. Hang on a minute. Let's just sort of stop that there. Right. Okay. So what we're going to do, we're going to go on to you. And I get it. All right. It's saying. It's saying that uh, we don't have a problem with you. So what, right. what I'm going to actually what I might do, right, is if I make you host, uh, no co-host, right, give you a little bit more power, right, right, okay, um, right. So if we can come back on, everyone is seeing this. So if I I've given her a little bit more power, so hopefully that might give her a little bit more doodah. I can see you. I could see you before. What I couldn't see with the screen share. Right. Not okay. What I'm going to what I'm going to do. Disabled. What, what I'm going to do is we're going to start now. Are you gone, Rachel? Are you still there? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Can you see anything now, Anne? <clears throat> I can see. I can see you. I can see you. All the you, people. You don't, I can you don't see, see the. It. I can see the gallery, and but I, I'm not seeing any screen sharing. The maps and the things he was talking about. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's the picture of a, a phone with all the apps on. Is what we can see. The the sort of the the, the face right. page of the phone. So. Yeah. Hmm. Right, okay, back to this again. So where it says disabled on yours, can you uh, can you click on that at all? Uh, 
Uh, now we've got the image. In a minute. Rachel, can you see what I can see now? All oh, right. It got, uh, well, uh, it on. Wait a minute. It's just saying no. Uh, this is about the YouTube, right? I can I can only see Carl's. You know your main your back to bit with your name on, and uh, and that's all I can see. And I can see everybody in the um, gallery. Actually, what you need to do? Can you get your cursor and tap on the screen? The cursor and tap on the screen. Tap on, yeah, basically yeah. get the cursor and try and click on to my, my, my image. All right. How's that working? That's just moved all the people down the side and that, that image is still there. It's still not, still not happening. Maybe I'll need to abandon it. I, I couldn't get anything last week. And, uh, you know, I've been working on half an hour this morning. And, 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 and why don't you just stay in the background and listen? Because last week I did, I stayed for a long time listening and I couldn't follow it because I couldn't see what you were talking no. about. It didn't add up quite. So, you know, if we can't resolve it, I don't know, my daughter was on a long time this morning trying to sort out what had gone. Sorry, you... Oh, right, right. Okay, then. She said we, I should leave it this time. I'm just talking to her. She said I should leave it this time and uh, try and reinstall Zoom. We don't actually need Zoom. Don't um, you? You, you, if you? If you, if you just um, join with the link, you can put the, the link into your um, search engine on your, on your toolbar and click on that, and it will take you into this and it just joins by the link. You don't actually have to have Zoom. Right. Uh, did you, there is a, did there you is hear a that, little... Rachel? Yeah. Did you follow that? Did you understand what that meant? What? Where I'd find this link and all the rest of it. I, I you know, it, it mean that so much of this doesn't mean anything to me. And I, you were very good, Andy, trying to explain it, but I, I, I'm actually, seeing this. Actually, there is an easy solution, right? All she, all you need to do is go onto my YouTube channel, and you'll be able to follow this on your YouTube channel. Okay. Yeah, if you if you um yeah, uh, if, yes. right. Uh, if you, yeah, if, okay. If you, I could if get the I could get get the lecture. I wouldn't quite get the community, but, would I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You would. You you would actually be able to um if if you if you keep your zoom on, right? Yeah, yeah. And you go onto my YouTube channel in another window, right? Yeah. Which is Carl J. Langford, Carl with a K, Carl J. Langford on YouTube. If you type into YouTube and in the search box, Carl James Langford, it'll come up this as being live. Okay. So you'll see the pictures that way. I will, yeah. I will, I will see if my daughter can do that now. <laughs> she's she's on okay. the other end of the phone and she can okay. do a lot from... Okay. Okay. So what we're going to do... It's crack Thank on, you. get, get, get on to us on YouTube. And uh, okay. you, there, um, on YouTube, there's a chat box and you'll be able to type in, hi, I'm Anne. So, got okay. it? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Okay, we'll crack on now, Anne. Right, no then. Okay. Okay, um, so you will be able to follow this. Any problems, just, just keep there. Good. The, the, the wonders of the internet, folks. Right. <laughs> So okay then, let's let's just go with this. Diggers or desecrators. So I think one of the things that everybody's been um, looking in regards to this genre of barrow digging is whether it's right, whether it's wrong. Too many people digging, too many mounds. Was it was it mm -hmm. um, the right thing to do then? Um, is it the right thing to look at it as the wrong thing today what they did in the past um, were these people just digging to get artifacts were they digging to find human remains were they digging just on a sunday was it a status thing loads of different questions so this is a nitty gritty, gritty. barrow digging gained much more of an impetus in the 1840s and in many areas where tumuli proliferated, the barrow openers, openers likewise increased. We've already looked uh, in many ways, 
with the differences in the terms of tumuli, barrows, dolmens, khans, and so on. In other words, they're mounds of earth. The years between 1840 and 1870 can be justified, strangely, strangely enough, to be called the boom years, when the subject almost approached the proportions of a field sport. You could say that that was the case in the 1800s or the 1750s, but now there was more raison d'etre to dig in into these barrows across the landscape. But archaeology was gaining a sense of professionalism. It's a bit like the argument today, metal detectors versus archaeologists, historians versus the archaeologists, all these little silly battles and squabbles. In 1851, the antiquarian Carrington, who we've mentioned before, says, in no age or nation have the investigations of the past from the contents of the tumuli been so arduously pursued as they have been of late in this kingdom. He was, work, he was writing at a time that only within a few years, you've got Charles Darwin came, coming up with his landmark thesis. And that thesis would challenge directly all the religious arguments that had happened before. And in fact, those are the arguments that archeologists had with the church as much as people with the science that Charles Darwin represented. Back to these diggers were reprehensibly called out more often than not in the mere, mere scrambling after relics. At this stage, the likes of the Cambrians in Wales who produced Archaeo and uh, Cambrensis at this stage and the likes of the Society of Scottish Antiquaries and the Society of Antiquaries in England and likewise all the other societies were at direct odds mm. with those barrow diggers, whether they were doing it for archaeology or for themselves. But lots of these societies couldn't argue with the fact that these barrow diggers were presenting these societies, these learned societies, with lots of relics to look at. Few descriptions of the work were committed to paper, unfortunately, but one or two harrowing accounts of these diggings would serve to represent many more. One of these odd excavations, we'll call them, was presented in the History and Antiquities of Cleveland and the excavations of a barrow on Bradleby Moor in the 1940s. The description is very much like this image or like these images. We're loving it, aren't we? Uh, charcoal and stones were flung up by the workmen's spades. Begins a depression, depressing account on the Balmby, Balmby Moor excavations of the 1840s. After a whole day's digging in this fashion, with dusk approaching and no finds made, the party, which included these guys, were about to relinquish the task in despair when a lad who was plying vigorously with his spade cried out, Damn it! Here's a bit of carved stone. Carved stone. Must have been a bit of Scottish in there. Carved stone. And was on the point of aiming a final Eto Brute blow at the precious relic when the narrator leaped down and arrested the fatal stroke. In other words, again, typical. A complete debacle, no less, but something being found as dusk falls 
of a barrow digger or an archaeologist working on the last day of an archaeological excavation. Beneath said stone was an urn. Despite the gathering in, in the dark, it was safely extracted. And the site and the work of a chap by the name of um, J. Walker Ord is said to have held it aloft to the delighted assemblage like a trophy in a barrow at Salt House Heath in Norfolk. It said, dug in 1850, alas, the other of the two great debacles, a certain Mr. Balding found a small and broken urn of sun-baked clay. It had apparently rested somewhere near the mound surface, but its position was not clearly ascertained. Alas, this image suffices for that wonder. For it was not observed until after it had been thrown out by the workmen. Do you know what? This is rather interesting, folks. And you can tell I'm, I'm ad-libbing a great deal from the text I've got in front of me. I was with Ellen yesterday, who, who, who worked through some artifacts for um, an excavation that we're involved in. Carl, you've gone. You've disappeared. Carl, where are you? I was on the edge of my seat then. <laughs> Carl, where are you? You're muted. Oh, it's disappeared into the ether. You're muted, Carl. It went off. What what you it went off. How did it go off? <laughs> Hang on, where was I? Where was I? Oh, I was, oh my God, he was on the edge of his seat. He, he, he wet himself then, Peter. <laughs> we were all where on was the edge I? of our seats. <laughs> was, I, was I looking at Mr. Baldwin's broken urn? Uh, uh, it was around his, his broken urn. All right, we'll do his broken bloody urn again. Let's get into it. <laughs> oh, God, I, I'm glad I've got you on the edge of your bloody seat. Um, I'm hoping that Anne is actually online now as well. Hang on a minute. There we go. The, the ed Where are we? The edge of your bloody seat. Hang on a minute. Right, OK, there, there we go. i got to be honest with you. Um, those fair women wa wandering on the I'm going... I'm going to leave you now because I cannot get it resolved. Are you going to join us on YouTube? Anne, are you joining no. us on YouTube? Uh, no. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can. Are you, you can are hear you me. Well, well, it, uh, when I got, went when I went on to when I went on to YouTube. Yeah, I've I've been on YouTube and I'm getting no, not now. I tried to. I did get up. I did some. <laughs> the, 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 the recordings are all going around in circles. And, and, You're not and, hearing me. And turn off the Zoom. Turn off the Zoom and just use YouTube. Yeah, bang on. Before you do, Carl, I've. Uh, I... And I've sent you the link on the chat. If you click on the chat button at the bottom of your screen on the on the Zoom thing, I've sent you the link. Just copy it and paste it into your whether you I don't know whether you're using. Wait a minute. I don't Google know. Or stretch. A I've, I've lost. I've lost the chat. I mean, maybe it's here. It's on the bottom. I'm if, if you take your cursor down, it should it should get a little line of a, a few little bits of pieces like participants chat, screen share, record. Right. I've clicked on the chat. <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. I can't now, see it. I can't now what see you, it. I've now what you've got. The... You've got your you you've got your YouTube on and you've got the Zoom on at the same time. Only watch the YouTube. 
and just watch the YouTube. Oh, she's having a right nightmare, folks. Mm. Do you join with the IT ID? Right. I, I, what, what, I, what, it, what it is, she's signed in. I think she's, it's, by the sounds of it, she was on YouTube and um, she was on, um, she's gone. What she was on, she'd signed in YouTube and Zoom at the same time. You yeah, could hear it. I find it easier to get in with using Firefox. Zoom and join with your ID. Right. Um, Mag, 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 you wouldn't have to have a phone number, would you? I haven't, no. No, I well, haven't got I'm hands sorry. either or an email address. But if, you, if you've got an email address for it, just send her the link the Zoom, the, to invite her to join the, because the, the, that's all she needs. She just needs to copy and paste that into the, you know, the yeah. bar at the top of a search, click on it, and it'll take her back, back in. I think mm -hmm. she she's got a glitch in her in the software because I've been trying to look through all the menus and I can't see anywhere where you can switch on and off the um, uh, screen uh, um, share. So there's something gone wrong there. But it's everyone on the edge of their seats. She needs um, to go in settings and change go. settings. Yeah, you can't. Don't, I've looked in there. It's not in there. What I'm going to do? I'm going to make it easier for it. Um, just sign into. Um, what I'll do, I'll give her the YouTube link now. Hang on a minute. Hang on. Share. Copy link. Because otherwise, she's going to be there all night. If, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm just going to do the idiot proof one. Not that she's an idiot, but you know what I'm trying to say. Right. Yeah. Just to sign into this. Now. And write on chat on YouTube. Uh, see you there. See you on the. Now everybody's on the edge of their seats, right? We got it. Right, good. Oh, <laughs> right. Oh, right. We're, we're, we're on the edge you now. We're on the edge of the world. Okay. Now, basically, Mr. Balding had found a small and broken piece of sun-baked clay. It had apparently rested somewhere near the mound surface, but its position was not clearly ascertained, but it was not observed until after it had been thrown out by the workmen. However, when I was working with Ellen um, yesterday, she went through a bucket of material from an archaeological excavation. And when on my excavations, not only does urban wear toe cap boots and high vis and helmets, Every, every grain of soil is sieved. And what I do at the end of the day, um, on the side of where the soil is sieved, I then put all that into a bucket, all the, all the lumps that haven't, we, you know, we haven't been able to break open because it's too hot, right? I put that in a massive bag, right? And I bring that back. And usually some of those, those lumps of clay uh, and um, some of it might be bits of pottery and whatever. So I went through this bucket yesterday and I put a hand scoop through and I felt the rim of a medieval pot from the, the, tw the 1250s. And I said to her, like, you'll hate me for finding this. So I, I presented her with a, a two and a half inch uh, rim of a medieval pot. And that was missed when the sieving was taking place because it was so um, congealed with clay and all the rest of it. Um, anyway, she washed that. And they, anyway, the point is, I believe that everything on an archaeological site should be sifted, right? When you think about it, excavations back then, they didn't sift things. And to, to have found, as in this, um, an artefact that had been thrown out by workmen is basically one of a number of artefacts that may or may not have been found. In the same year, a certain Mr. Um, Greville Chesters described a novel way of dealing with a concreted mass of cremated bone found in a barrow at Rufton Mill. And he would say, with great difficulty, we separated it with repeated blows of a spade. And you're starting to think that, you know, the, these people are complete mogadons working on you know, these sites. From the middle years of the 1800s, many antiquaries began to view with growing concern the increasing destruction of the barrows of Britain in a plundering search for treasure. But there were no rules. Nobody had set any rules for the archaeology. Nobody had basically said you should do this 
oh, you should do that. And sometimes even the antiquaries would be making massive mistakes. So how do you differentiate between plundering for treasure and those that were the actual antiquaries themselves? A John Ackerman, for example, writing in 1854, noted that in Wiltshire, no inconsiderable number had been dug into under the hands of pseudo antiquaries. He revealed that scores of our prime evil tumuli have been explored in a manner so careless as to jeopardize the contents and often to reduce them to fragments. Remember what um, Greville Chesters had said at Rufton Mill. With great difficulty, we separated it with repeated blows of a spade. That is a concreted mass of cremated bone. Now, what the hell was that cremated mass of bone? We know it was human bones. But that to me even sounds interesting in itself, but that is no longer with us today. In a work written by Charles Warren in 1866, entitled Celtic Tumuli of Dorset, Mr. Warren had much to say on the subject since Dorset's barrows had suffered more than those of most counties from poor excavation. In the introduction to his book, he remarked that the re uh, and, and this is how he remarked the requirements or in many instances, the cupidity of the age have tolerated such an obliterating spirit that a large proportion of these our time hallowed records have passed from amongst us. And this destructive interest has especially prevailed, prevailed within the past few years. And we can only think and only look at horror that the, the sense of damage like this being caused to those barrows. At the end of the day, these barrows are the free prerequisite and the ownership of our ancestors in the very vein of their mortal remains in regards to the bone and the artifacts that they're buried with. The Victorians may have seen hilarious this sketch that we pre present in front of us. And this was sent in sense entitled The Unexpected Consequences of Opening a Barrow. This is presented by a man by the name of Peter Hutchinson. He would say that this would be would be diggers are driven off a Devon burial mound by its infuriated inhabitants. And in many ways, is are those infuriated inhabitants actually the living as well as the dead? And I, I would say that we are talking about the dead and the living, as the caption gives us that impression. I am black and blue all over with hand thumps. And, you know, it, 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 to me, it's a double edged sword looking at, you know, let's j accuse those diggers. And let's try and maybe look at those stopping us digging the mound. Also, our friend Charles Warren says, desecrating these time hallowed monuments for no better purpose than the indulgence of a craving acquisitiveness and the adornment of glass cases. We, 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 we saw that the other week with ill understood relics to be paraded for the empty admiration of those who may descend to flatter the equally vain and ignorant collector. This 
was the new age of cabinets full of artifacts. Do you know when when we when you know who would think have a, having um, cabinets full of artifacts, but they did exist. You know, only a few weeks ago, Bateman, Thomas Bateman, we we, we saw sort of you know um, um, a, a sketch of, of of his cabinets full of human skulls. This sort of, in in, in many ways, what we're seeing is Charles Wall, Charles Warren in 1866 is tongue in cheek, looking at Bateman and his cabinet. But Bateman is also noticing the disappearance of the barrows that he was partly responsible for digging in the first place. Hypocrisy, in a large part due to the ill-conducted pillage of idle curiosity. Do you know, I, I will reiterate the sense of the time that we live in. We have got cabinets and boxes and museum storerooms full of artifacts that we don't know what they are. We've got artifacts in some museums that have never, never seen the light of, of day since they were put in the boxes. And, and they have not been studied. And why therefore do we go out excavating archeological sites? Do you know, I've got a site that I own of national importance, right? And, and I could dig it any time. I could present the most wonderful archeological report. I'm talking about myself, right? But I don't wanna do it. Um, I'm not ready to excavate this site because I feel that I need to publish lots of my other work. And then I deserve the right to excavate a site that I actually own, that I don't need permission to excavate. And, you know, because I know myself that I, I have got stuff that I need to look at, I've got boxes of artifacts that I need to publish and for people to understand. So it's not just the idle curiosity. This has always been the problem in archaeology, and it's a shame it wasn't addressed 200 years ago. Because there was nothing to stop these people digging those barrows. It wasn't until the 1880s that, that sites in Britain had some level of protection. The theme was becoming a heated topic by the mid 1860s. Leading another writer, a John Mortimer, who had comment, commenced his vast operations in the East Riding of Yorkshire in 1863 to write in the publication known as um, Reliquy. It seems a great pity that barrow digging are not better conducted and the examination made with far greater care and labour than what we read in the newspaper de details of Yorkshire diggings. Was this intended as a criticism of the excavations at the time, and particularly the excavations by a certain canon, Greenwell, and the investigation of the walls in Yorkshire. Um, and again, looking at this image again, again, loving this image, seeing this image, and, you know, it's amazing, this image. It, it, it's on so many different levels, this image. It's loving it. This, this, the, the, the caption for this image is, um, not Yorkshire, but we can think of this as being anywhere. A barrow in Kent opened under the auspices of Lord Albert Cunnington, Cun Cunningham, Cunningham in 1844, reveals the mound under inspection by his Lordship's party with interruptions from a rainstorm. Now, you know, it's just like, th this is typical. It, it's like, you know, we, I've got money, I'm a canon, I'm a Lord, I'm a Sir. You know, I've got money to bloody do this, right? Um, and it, it's, it's all over. And, you know, and then in many ways, the antiquarian societies that are being established in the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, and so on, are actually responding to uh, this dearth of material rather than stopping it. Um, you know, it's like, let, let's, you know, let's as a society 
you know, go out and see somebody digging holes in a field um, rather than let's get the boxes out and look at the artifacts in the boxes. Our, our, our friend again, our, our friend again, uh, it, this, um, our, our friend John Mortimer writes, and let's do it in his voice with, with, with the gravity that he deserves. I speak out as an experienced authority on such matters and defy any antiquary to properly examine nearly 20 barrows within the month. Although Mortimer himself once dug 10 in 13 days. So he was a hypocrite. Back to what Mortimer said. As was lately expressed in the columns of the leading newspapers, I sincerely pray these remarks may for the future prove of service by putting a check in the speculations of the curiosity seeker and of the individual who is actuated by that cursed spirit of gain which has in late years spoiled so many of our Yorkshire tumuli. So in many ways, our, our friend Mortimer, even though he was a barrow digger himself, he realized the errors of his ways, but damage had been done. Now he was vocally critical of other individuals. Now, the same dichotomy can be of today, where, where, where we could... Where, where we could look at Time Team and Time Team with its new series. Um, it, it's on the vein of the original Time Team series, which is great. Um, and what we do see is people digging in a hole, making the most of finding little bits. And that's exactly what archaeology is about. And it makes it fun. We find a bit of medieval pottery and we build a medieval building out of it on Time Team. It's great. You know, we see, see this reconstruction. But people, people in the medieval period didn't know what that bit of pottery meant, right? So they weren't interested in that bit of pottery. They weren't interested in the bones. They were interested in the antiquaries that would offer a talking point, right? I, I remember showing people boxes of pottery when I was a child and um, and they would be bored, bored to death, right? Because they weren't interested, but to another archeologist, they would be, right? Um, and I think what we've got is, is the misunderstanding of what archaeology is about by many in the 1800s. Um, and that goes through the, the, the real nuts and bolts of anyone that studies late um, archaeology in the 1800s. So if we look at the likes of Schliemann with his excavations at Troy, in the um, 1870s, he, he basic, he's basically digging and he finds loads of artifacts, right? But he's really missing the buildings that are actually about Troy. When he meets a German archaeologist called Dolfold, Dolfold tell, says that you've actually buggered this up, Dr. Schliemann. And he goes back with Dr. Schliemann and they really excavate Troy properly, scientifically, with plans and recording everything. And then we found out that Schliemann had actually found um, Homer's, um, the, 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 the Troy of Homer, we had actually dug through it earlier on, but they actually eventually found it. So it, it, in archaeology, it, in the 1800s, it's, it's learning and making mistakes as you go along. But these mistakes are being made at the loss of thousands of barrows, not just in Britain, but across the world. And we could talk about the barrow diggers of the United States there in that as well. Even in the 18, 18, 1860s, our friend Mortimer, he begs antiquaries to perform the work well and most scientifically, instead of hacking up a great number in an incredible short time. What does that mean scientifically? What, what is science in regards to archeology span in the 1850s, 1860s? Science, archeology span is a science, can still be debated by some today whether it's a science or not. As an editor of Willockery, the archaeologist Jewett again, which we mentioned in the works of um, that, 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 that we mentioned previous in the works of Thomas Bateman, 
He, he remarks on the subject condemning the hasty, indiscriminate and incomplete manner in which some of the Yorkshire tumuli have been opened, which called for some kind of serious rebuke from genuine antiquaries and from those who love the science which they have espoused. Jowett again writes that wholesale destruction by persons of whom better things ought to be looked for of barrows on the Yorkshire walls. So he's actually um, he's actually criticizing um, the work that Mortimer had criticized by the work of a canon Greenwell. But then again, what's happening is people are, are now in the sights of the proverbial canon that, um, you know, people are starting to say, you know, enough is enough, but enough isn't enough because nobody's doing, nobody's stopping it. Um, Dewey in Antiquary wrote that um, notoriety and display, not science and genuine research are the objects of explorers and ransackers of the barrow. After all, why would you want to spend a whole day in a field not finding anything? So you may as well find something. Let's just hack through it with people under umbrellas looking at your work, you know? Um, this this chap this chap is a guy by the name of Weatherfield, which which we will come on to in a few moments. Looking at Silbury Hill and obviously going into Silbury Hill, and obviously across the land, you've got other bits of archaeology that might be seen or might be missed at the same time. When when we think. Um, What's, what's looking at the work in Yorkshire at this time in the 1860s, um, it said that the archaeological, um, the, the work of archaeologists, the object of which is to destroy the largest numbers of barrows in the least possible time and to bag the spoils in order that the unenviable achievements may be duly chronicled in the times of other journals. In other words, I found 10 pots, you found one, Adam. Um, so in other words, this is actually competition. See, how, it's not just about how many mounds that we could dig into, how much we can find. And at the end of the day, how much of the evidence we can fake at the same time. Do you know what I'm gonna say? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do an all obvious, that when people are saying they found something in the mound over there, how do you know that they didn't find 20 items in one mound and then they say that they find they found items in lots of different mounds you know it is just that it's a competition it is not the number of barrows which can be opened done as the common galloping tourist expression is in a season genuine archaeologists know no seasons and no campaigns but the scrupulous careful examination of a few when circumstances are favorable and time can be devoted that bestow a lasting benefit on prehistory and prehistorians so in other words let's just focus and get some data rather than excavating, excavating umpteen mounds. And back to this image again, it would have been pleasant to report that the growing awareness of wholesale barrow mutilation and destruction was arrested by the protests of the enlightened. But unfortunately, bad excavation was not a uh, prerequisite solely of the 1800s. Um, it is an evil that has endured well into the present century, coupled with the careless, obliterated, wrought by modern agriculture and the expansion of industry and building programs. It has led to the eradication of a vast number of burial mounds, destruction that could ill be afforded. So in other words, it's still going on today, but not necessarily by those barrow diggers. So let's let's try and let's try and introduce another character in this, a chap by the name of Web Merrifield. Merryweather, Merryweather, quite appropriate, isn't it? Merryweather, when we're getting so much bad weather. Uh, Merryweather. From about the time Thomas Bateman was beginning his operations Derbyshire, so we can remember the 1840s, um, barrow digging was being vigorously um, prosecuted in a number of English counties. Workers of varying degrees of skill and competence or incompetence were carrying out programmes of barrow research in Wiltshire, Yorkshire, uh, Dorset, um, Cornwall, all over the place, um, South Wales, you name it, Scotland, it goes on. Since an attempt to list all the busy enthusiasts and asset, assess and examine their work would take a vast amount of space to narrate, 
Only the work of more important or notorious, no, notorious will be included, beginning with the activities of some of the better known Wiltshire antiquaries. And one of them being, um, one of the most notorious of these was Dean John Merrifield, or Merriweather. Why do they call him Merrifield? Merriweather of Hereford, who lived between 1797 and 1850, who between 18, 18th of July and the 14th of August, 1849, opened on the Marlborough Downs, wait for it, 35 barrows. And actually, one of these barrows included Silbury Hill. He dug into Silbury Hill. That's one of the barrows he excavated between the 18th of July and the 14th of August, 1849. One of the 35 barrows. And as a barrow, this is one bloody big barrow. Silbury Hill, and he excavated at West Ken at Long Barrow also. This concentrated um, sense of despoiling was afterwards written up from Merriweather's notes and published posthuma posthumously in a small book called Diary of a Dean, Dean John Merriweather of Hereford, Dean. The publication shows that the Dean, Dean not in name, but Dean in nature, was a most enthusiastic barrow digger, no S-H-I-T, who like others of his ilk, derived great pleasure from his researches. He dedicated the book as a legacy, legacy to my um, native county, whose antiquaries I began to, uh, uh, antiquaries, began in early life to study. The text shows that he had undertaken previously bar previous Barrow investigations. He certainly accompanied Richard Hoare on operations in the early 1800s, but no record of these appear to be available. So in other words, lots of mounds that Merriweather dug, there's no record of where he dug at all. There's no record of the artifacts. There's no record at all, right? It's a bit like, um, I don't know, um, uh, uh, what 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 analysis can we we have of this? It's a bit like taking your children to all the Butlins in 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 Britain in the nineteen um, sixties and not remembering a single Butlins that you went to. How criminal would that be? But these are barrows that we've got no records of anything. He casually mentions visiting one barrow on the Downs, almost on the bank of Wands Dyke, which he had dug some 30 years before. And that's all the record that we've got. That's all the record that we've got. And I'm gonna share a list with you now, right? Uh, which you'll be shocked with, right? And um, Dean Merriweather, we know published, um, we know, gave some information about 35 mounds that he dug into, but we don't know of the umpteen others that he dug that we've got no record of. There's, there's a digger called Ruddock who's excavating in Yorkshire in the 1840s, 1848, 1858. He told us, we've mentioned Ruddock before, Ruddock um, dug a hundred mounds, but he probably dug 300 more, but we don't have any records of them. There's, there's another chap called Atkinson, who in Yorkshire dug in 1860 to 1890. We know that he published uh, digging 33 mounds, but 100 plus, we've got no, no idea what he dug. So he dug a hundred mounds, and we've no idea where those mounds were, what he found. We've got no information about them at all. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about the number of, of sites that I've excavated, but I'm going to get them published. Um, and I've excavated a lot. I've, I've excavated a lot of sites which have had my work published, which is great. Right. Um, but excavating 300 mounds and not publishing any of the work, that, that's absolutely shocking. Shocking. Um, you know, we think about Merriweather, Dean Merriweather and his 35 mounds and, and other people have excavated hundreds. And we don't know. We don't know. 
We don't, we don't know where these mounds were, really. Um, Merriweather, Merriweather, a little bit about his background. Um, we're not going to do this in full. He became Dean of Hereford in 1832. Um, he was in f- favour of, of the kings of the day and, and, and uh, uh, Prime Minister Melbourne, for, for example, um, in the 1830s. However, Merriweather seems to have become increasingly bitter about the church. And he was um, soured by his experiences that when um, uh, he, he basically um, got so disillusioned um, that digging out there, um trying to find antiquaries were his way of getting closure um he, he was he was a little bit of a um an unfulfilled dean in other words reading uh, the backstory one of the dean's most ambitious schemes in 1849 as we've got presented in front of us and between um between the 18th of july um, and 14th of August, 1849. He didn't excavate on this mound alone. He excavated on 34, 34 other mounds. This, this was, he excavated here sometime. This was financed by the Royal Archaeological Institute, which was relatively new then, who were meeting in Salisbury at the time. Merriweather attended the Congress and used his spare time to organise a series of diggings in connection with it. Silbury had been dug in 1777 by Cornish tin miners, as we're already aware, working for the Duke of Northumberland and a certain Colonel Drax. They had sunk a shaft five foot square down through the huge pile to the original ground surface, finding nothing, though Drax believed they had discovered the Druid Oak over which he he, he felt for some obscure reason the mound had been raised. A railway engineer called Bladford was contracted to organise Merriweather's workmen who were to drive a tunnel into Silbury Hill from the south side. And there is an image of it. Um, And it said of the excavation, it could hardly be expected that these two small openings would be likely to find the primary grave under Silbury Hill, then two rat holes would be likely to come upon the ashes of a mouse placed under a mound 10 foot in diameter. So in other words, they're saying that Merriweather had no chance, but it was fair game nevertheless. Since Merriweather could not present all the time he was lodging between Salisbury and his other diggings. He arranged for the labourers digging the tunnel to cease work within two foot of the presumed mound centre. Such accuracy was beyond them, and they went seven foot further. So in other words, they went, they, they dug just through whatever was in the middle and destroyed it and kept going seven foot further. Matters were complicated when uh, a certain Blanford, considering he had fulfilled his contract, ceased work, and Merriweather had to take over. Little was found in the vast heap, but Merriweather left an urn containing documents and a lead sheet with details of the opening. This was found by the BBC sponsored excavators in, in 1969 when they were seeking more scientifically the answers that the Dean had been looking for over 130 years previously. Incidentally, Merriweather's tunnel, barely wide enough for two people to bypass each other, was still negotiable as it is in the early years of the 1900s until it was finally blocked by the Office of Work shortly after the First World War. So it was closed for good, but you could actually get in there. I tell you what, I wouldn't. Merriweather's little book contains some sketches of inhumation burials and some of the pottery and artefacts found together with ground plans of certain earthworks. And and whether that was to do with this or not is is another statement. Little is revealed concerning his methods of opening 
the, the brief mention that the men were sent to commence operations on two mounds of large dimensions suggests the continuing malpractice of directing unsupervised labour gangs to wreak unhavoc, un unchecked havoc on luckless barrows. So in other words, without an archaeologist, there's no chance that they're going to be able to really understand what's there. So you may as well just send a load of school children to dig. They're, they're, you know, school children would be better because they'd probably have an idea what they're looking for. Um, and sort of looking at this, this little caption, the Archaeological Institute of Great Britain and Ireland caused this tunnel to be excavated. This is that plaque that, that was associated uh, with the urn um, excavated in 1849, a shaft from the summit to the base had been sunk about six, six, 75 years earlier previously by other parties. On neither occasion was anything discovered indicative of the purpose for which the hill was raised. So in other words, what a muck up. And in, um, it might be that all the evidence for what the mound was about in, in, in 1777 and the excavations of Merriweather in 1849 were actually, um, um, were, were destroyed forever, ever. Um, Merriweather's records, some of the diggings as laborious due to the size of certain mounds. One cutting went 10 feet deep, another 12 feet. Just the vagueness of this. Um, in this last opening, the closeness of the soil and the depth we had to descend occupied more than uh, usual of our time and the evening was was far spent before we reached such a depth in the other barrows as to satisfy our curiosity so in other words it's very strange that you're, you're thinking like that but you're thinking well you know it it, it seems that oh, if we don't get to the archaeology within an hour then you know it's it's, it's you know um it's it basically when 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 we think about the work of merriweather um, and we think about, you know, um, what's what's the value of what he's doing, um, and what is the point? You know, this is this is one of Merriweather's sketches um, of what was more or less seemingly left of one of the mounds he was excavating. Um, Merriweather took the trouble to record conversations with local peasantry respecting local barrows. So in other words, he wrote down what they thought, but really not recorded everything that he found. One shepherd told him how one of the shepherd boys had hooked up a crock out of a small barrow on by downhill. The lad knocked the pot to pieces with his crook to see whether it contained treasure. And on visiting the site, the dean found urn shirts lying around. So in other words, it wasn't just these barrow diggers that were destroying. It was normal, everyday people who really didn't understand what they were finding. Merriweather also spoke to a man who had helped in the destruction of Mill Barrow, a chambered long barrow near Avebury. This one that's not familiar to me, probably because there's nothing left of it. The man rec uh, recollected a sort of room built up um, by big sarsens. Uh, put together like as well as a mason could set them up. In the room was a site of black stuff and it did smell um, bad. The dean uh, recollected not opening a barrow inside an earthwork on the down since it showed evidence of being dug from the apex downward to some depth. Thinking the whole to the work of an antiquary. So in other words, what they did, they didn't dig where somebody else had a, a dug. Rarely did Merriweather record re the constructional details of his barrows, and chalk cut graves were invariably kists. Like others of his time, he had occasion to note the presence of sightseers, the finding of a Roman coin hoard near the surface of a barrow. Listen to this. So, if we go back to this, it's sort of people, you know, coming in sightseeing again, but obviously different from this. Merriweather wrote about this find of a coin hoard, greatly excited the interest of the bystanders of the laboring class who had on many occasion shown a disposition to watch our proceedings under the impression which in all quarters possessed them to my cost, I know it. In some cases to the destruction of antiquarian treasure that such excavations are made for the purpose of finding money. Um, 
so he's trying to work out why why our friend Merriweather was digging if he wasn't doing it for some kind of glory anyway. Um, it's saying that these congresses, these antiquarian congresses, would be set up, and they they would they would set up um excavations for antiquarians to actually look at and these were said to be the same antiquarians um that, that were disagreeing with their work it's it's quite ironic uh as a finale to his excavations in 1849 the night following work in unfavorable weather a dramatic um high thunderstorm set the seal on Merryweather's wiltshire excavations this event was much to the satisfa satisfaction of the rustics, whose notions re representing the examinations of Silbury and the opening of the barrows were not um, seen to lack superstition. So the heavens opening up to, to um, make Merriweather suffer in his last excavations. The Dean described it as one of the most grand and tremendous thunderstorms he'd ever recollected. It made the hills uh, re-echo to the crashing pearls and Silbury itself as the men asserted who were working in its center to tremble at its base. So there was Merriweather felt that his last dig in excavations was punished by the gods. Merriweather died in 1850. His work left much to be desired and his failures include the ever recurrent one of not positively identifying key most of his sites he'd worked on. So it was a complete pointlessness of most of his work. The most a abiding feelings about his 1849 visitation of the 35 excavations, the diggings of barrows in 28 days plus Silbury and West Kennet, the form of the largest ancient artificial mound in Europe, and the later among the largest long barrows in Britain. In other words, what we're talking about is, again, Merriweather, like some of the other antiquaries, did great damage. An antiquary known as John Ackerman between 1806 and 1873 said that, um, that in his work in Wiltshire, though not a prolific excavator, made some pertinent comments on the downland barrows in 1854 worth reprinting for his wry pessimism regarded the likelihood of their producing any worthwhile finds. This is somebody talking about barrows, whether they contained finds or not. Here we go. Experience has taught me to, start again, experience has taught me not to anticipate great things from excavations. I interject. That's a good start. I had learned long ago that a rude and crumbling urn or a simple heap of ashes and bones were the frequent result of a whole day's digging in these early sepulchre mounds, barrows to us. Besides the possibility of our working long in one which had been explored by previous investigators more intent in the acquisition of treasure than the procuring of antiquarian relics. So in other words, he's talking about mounds and, and the mundaneness of the mounds, but also talking about other people excavating and what they had discarded. They're looking again at, you know, the, the, the presentation of the damage of archaeology. Another chap by the name of Reverend Lucas in 1817, died in 1892. A scholar of European fame was active among Wiltshire Barrows um, at Cow Down between 1855 and 1860, uh, 1861, and later at Barrows in Yorkshire. So one minute he's working in Wiltshire and the next he's working in Yorkshire. He was, a good, he lived, he was of a Guernsey family. Lucas opener of a number of chambered tombs on his native island and in many ways ahead of his time. Lucas realised and urged the importance, interestingly enough, of recording the fine spots of casually found prehistoric artefacts. 
such as bronze or stone implements. And guess what? Lucas was ahead of his day. Not only might we think of making sketches and recording the artifacts, the localities he saw was important. Lucas thought that the germs of distribution maps plotting, and we say germs of distribution maps plotting, was important. He felt that maps were the key to understanding the past, and he was right. Again, he believed the importance of recording casual finds. So, for example, Andy's wandering over there. Where have you found, Andy? I found a flint. Where have you found it? Corner of the field. We're going to take a note of that. Instead of putting it in your pocket and going home. Lucas was, Lucas was ahead of his day. Not only was he interested in digging mounds, he was also interested in recording fine spots of individual finds, which were on the surface. His observations on the burials found in megalithic term, the tombs were very much in advance of their time. We mentioned Lucas in this list of barrow diggers, right? We mentioned Lucas, for example, had dug 26 mounds, but it took him between 1842 and 1864 in Wiltshire, Yorkshire and Cambridgeshire. In, in, less, in 28 days, Merriweather had excavated 35 mounds. So Lucas must have been ridiculed in his time, but remembered in posterity for his contribution to archaeology. Lucas had noted in 1837, as early as 1837, the presence of parts of bodies and accumulations of bones in the tombs of Guernsey, and felt that the burial of these part bodies was some sort of right. So in other words, now he was coming up with conclusions with what these bones meant. His ideas foreshadowed modern interpretations of temporary pre-burials of bodies, a special mortuary sites. He wrote somewhat, um, he wrote somewhat um, ahead of Thomas Bateman in regards to the following. I'm informed that in China, the body is buried temporarily and when denuded of flesh, the bones are taken up and carried to the tomb with great pomp. If such was the custom during the stone period, much of our observations will have their full explanation. So in other words, Lucas in 1837 is a master of his craft. Ahead of everybody else, Lucas is telling us that we've got to record everything. He noted that the discovery of parts only of skeletons within kists is worthy of examination when others would just discard the bones. Now, perhaps too often attributed to past disturbance, Lucas had realized that when bones had been disturbed, they were disturbed after the burials had been put into the ground. And, you know, we were talking about rats and sort of voles the other, other week, you know. Lucas is discussing about other, other burials in regards or disturbance and so on. Lucas' observations show a refreshing and original slant on burial customs and indicate a far-sighted thinker. Many of his ideas and ideas had elements of truth in them that only became evident much later in the minds of more modern archaeologists. Before we look a little bit more about Lucas, and then we have a well-deserved break, and then we'll probably do a little bit more of Barrow Diggers, and then we'll do some of the other things I promised tonight. I would like us to think about the following, right? 
and I'm actually going to Pete. Can you, um, Pete from Adorset? Can you come on? Can you come on the? Can you come on the chat a minute? Can you talk to me? Me. Me? You? Yes, I want to talk to you. Yes. Oh. Right. Can I just? Um, can I just um, basically present you with a load of facts? There's a barrow mm -hmm. over there. There's a body found in it. There's a barrow over there. Body found in it. There's a barrow over there. No body found in it. An artifact found there. Um, and you've got four four bits. Do all of those represent everything that's ever found? No. Yes, and that's no. You are correct in your answer. No, no, the answer. And the point is. The biggest problem is you're doing your field work. It's not necessarily that the field work that you're doing is going to include everything because not everything's been published. Mm -hmm. And in fact, within some of the localities that you're looking, not everything has been recorded. And that can be said even with some modern archaeology. When I was involved in the damage caused to the work at the Fard Mile Lane, which is just north of Barry, the A4226, which will always remain with me, um, my biggest bugbear was that the archaeologist had left human remains on the site unrecorded and pottery on site unrecorded. Um, and they didn't put these things in their final reports. And I made this public. Or, or they never recorded them in the first place. And they basically said, oh, we accidentally left them behind. Or, um, you know, they're not human remains when in fact they clearly clearly were. And all, all these excuses would be given. Oh, they're not. They're, they're random in the field. Right. The problem is when you've got that type of thinking, you're always going to miss stuff. And when you miss stuff in archaeology, it becomes very biased. Right. So what you've got to do, Peter, you've got to have an open mind. And, and when you've got everything, your glass is not always going to be full. Would you agree with that or not? Yeah, yeah, no, I do. Yeah. <laughs> so what can you do to what can you do to try and get as much information as you can on on an existing landscape? Uh, well, one, exploring it. I think that's very important. Yes. And then and and research you know when you go back to this early research i think it's always important to ask, ask the question have they missed anything and mm. i think the answer is 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 what were they looking for i'll give you a good example of this a few years ago i i was talking to an archaeologist and they said oh um there, there was there was an excavation in um in libya right and the archaeologist was not interested in the, what well, was, I've got to take a note of something a minute. The archaeologist was not interested in the Roman temple at the site. They were interested in the Greek temple at the site. So they said, uh, they, they blew up the Roman temple, right? And they bulldozed it. And then they excavated the Greek temple. And they put nothing of the Roman temple in their report. They basically said, we've come, across the, uh, come across upon the Greek site, right? But the Greek site was not really in a good state of, there was not much left there. And then you go to that report and you say, why didn't they, was there anything there before? If they found this Greek temple, why was it in such a bad state? Why was it just the footings left there? Does that mean that there may have been a temple on top? And those are the types of questions you've got to ask yourselves. Um, and, and the other thing as well is when you come to, when you, when you look at lots of archaeology from across Britain, right, what you usually find, I'll give you another example, um, at Tinkinswood Burial Chamber in the Vale of Glamorgan, when they excavated there, they, well, when they've excavated there, they, they've said, oh, we found human remains of... The Neolithic period and you know this was built in the Neolithic period and this and that and and so on right they tend to see to forget the fact that they found Bronze Age material there Iron Age material there Roman pottery and medieval pottery right but because they believe that that's not relevant right 
they've not put in their report. Unfortunately, everything in archaeology is relevant. You miss the archaeology at your peril. You are biased about the archaeology at your peril. And I mentioned Schliemann earlier on. Schliemann was looking for a certain Troy and he went, dug straight through it. And then eventually, when he came back in the 1880s, Dolfelt made, made Schliemann a good archaeologist. And he actually found the Troy that Homer had originally written about. Thank you for that, Peter. Uh, Lucas was a third son um, and a third son of a Frederick Dubois Lucas. So uh, basically, um, you know, it was the thing to have a little bit of money to excavate on Guernsey and the excavating on Brittany and Derbyshire, Anglesey and Ireland. Um, our friend Lucas um, excavated a site at Buxton in 1865. I recorded in reliquy. He wrote to his father, I indeed felt truly happy in again following the pursuit that his dad had taught him because his dad had taken him to lots of these different places and his dad had been a digger. What you have taught us, his brother was also a digger, uh, from our cradle to take delight in. Lucas's report of work at Cow Down contains a good plan of the Barrow Cemetery, though no scale is shown, which is a bit of a shame. There are also stylized plans of some barrows and a few sections plus sketches of the main finds, right? Um, and this is similar to, um, you know, similar to sort of what Cunning, this is one of Cunnington's um, sketches from 18. 55, but this is the type of stuff that Lucas may have done as well. The, um, he dug 17 barrows in the group. In the Wiltshire Archaeological Magazine and later in the Yorkshire Archaeological Journal, he had some harsh things to say about coal hauls operations a few decades earlier. Although having the advantage of hindsight, he neglected to recall that Hall was an enlightened pioneer edging into an unexplored realm. Although admitting Hall's praiseworthy aim, Lucas accused him of unwittingly doing as much as any man could, could to prevent archaeologists from knowing to the full extent what his, his vast researches and extensive experience should have taught him respecting Wiltshire Barrows and to mislead barrow diggers of a later day. So in other words, what he's saying of Cole Hall is that Cole Hall, because of the way he dug, was not offering us the information that could have been offered. In other words, if you're gonna do archeology, span give all your information, show all your evidence. He deplored the loss of information relating to the, to the construction of Barrows, which was not recorded by Hall, Cole Hall. And Lucas said of Cole Hall's work. So in other words, what we've gone full circle now, we've been criticizing earlier antiquaries excavations, Antiquarians are criticizing earlier antiquarian excavations. How many articles, this is what Lucas wrote. How many articles of antiquity, and the Stadigan, how many articles of antiquity of great value have been overlooked and lost through the mode in which he persecuted his researches? If he himself had handled the spade or been continually present with his labors, we should not now have to lament the unscientific opening of innumerable barrows. So in other words, Cole Hall is being criticized and should have recorded more of his excavations. But Cole Hall was a pioneer decades earlier and nobody had a textbook for what you should or shouldn't record. Lucas is saying you should record everything. But then again, Lucas is gonna miss stuff as, again himself. Lucas recalled that had he followed Hoare's methods in digging, the Collingborough group that he excavated himself, the largest barrow would have been an enigma 
And I should have wondered why so vast a cenotaph had been raised. Lucas's strictures on Hall's central sharp opening technique are interesting, since a famous contemporary of his, Thurman, was still using the method of his own Wiltshire digging. So in other words, um, it's sort of, go back to this, here, here we go. Just sort of um, digging in, just sort of, just, just dig. Um, Lucas said about earlier excavations, Kennington and Hall, in many cases, we have difficulty in ascertaining the material of their construction. The site of the internment within the barrow is frequently only implied instead of being accurately noted. We are led to the conclusion that the chief, if not sole object in the investigation, was the prosecution of the articles which had been dis uh, deposited with the dead. So in other words, Lucas was interested in everything, layers, warts and all. Lucas returned, um, would continually return to um, excavating, um, to understanding, and to writing up his work in Yorkshire archaeological journals and the likewise. So what we're going to do, we're going to um, do a little bit more of this after the break. And then what we're going to do, we're going to do some of the other articles. So... Um, uh, it's not as riveting as uh, the other week when we did Barrow Diggers, but there's there's some things that we could note from it. Um, and what we can do after the break is do a little bit more of this. And then what we can do then is, is basically um, do some of the other items, which are Redstone being one of them. Right, so let, let's have a break. And it's a shame that... Uh, it's a shame that we lost um, Anne tonight. So obviously we should be back, back next week. Um, as uh, Peter's just fallen asleep on his bed, Peter, <laughs> anything you want to tell us? No, no, I'm all good. Thank you. Good, good, good. Uh, Adam, on Uranus, what would you like to say to us? <laughs> uh, nothing, cheers, Carl. That was very good. Thank you. Um, Adam with something sticking out of his... Uh, Adam with... Uh, oh, bloody hell! <laughs> but Andy with yeah. something sticking out of his head. Sticking out my head. Yeah. Where? Oh, that. That's. You got something sticking out. Yeah, exactly. It's the microphone. Yeah, go on. Um. No, no. Blowing a hooli up here though. It just, is. Just been out to put the bins back. But. Mm. Um, no. Yeah, my then, lights keep going out. Yes. Yeah, ours have flickered a couple of times. So we, if, if our side goes out, you know what's gone wrong, Carl. It's all this up. talk about barrows. Yeah. Making the lights. Mm turn off and on yeah. it's a bit spooky <laughs> it, 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 it certainly is right margaret what would you like to say i'm gonna i'm gonna look at uh um i'm, I'm going to um ask go on i'm gonna look at this email from duda and i'm just gonna um see um go on margaret talk to us well, give it, uh, seeing as it was Victorian times and they were rather religious people <clears throat> back then, I'm surprised, um, and a lot of them were clergymen that were doing the digging, I'm surprised that they felt comfortable desecrating, and it was desecration, wasn't it, really, of um, people's graves. Uh, it, it, was, it was complete desecration of people's graves. and. Um, and to discard the human remains that they're finding only goes to, to look at their profession and how what they felt about human remains that they were inferring. You know what I mean? Well, they uh, worried about catching diseases. I don't know uh, how nobody, long diseases uh, can no, live no, for. Nobody, nobody was worried about catching diseases then. You you look at um, yeah, you look at Basil Jett and Doc, Dr. Snow in the late 1850s, um, early uh, 1860s. Um, people had no idea that contaminated water was causing diseases. Uh, you had outbreaks of cholera and typhus at the end of the 1840s <clears throat> with mass graves in different towns. They mm -hmm. had no idea of the spread of disease up until um, the Crimea War um, and up until the likes of the 18, uh, late 1850s and 1860s. They had no idea. So what bones could do to you? They, it, it's very interesting there might be a correlation. Lots of these barrow diggers seem seem to have dig um, seem to have died quite young. 
Yeah. That's a really actually, yeah, actually, this is a really good point. Um, I wonder what they died of. Be yeah. interesting to know, wouldn't it? Yeah, that would be interesting to know. Very interesting question. Yeah. But if it's a Bronze Age burial, I don't know how long a disease, tuberculosis, hepatitis, I don't know how long these things would linger in a, a grave from that time. Uh, Anthrax remains live for hundreds, if hundreds not thousands of years. Of years. Yeah. Mm. So, um, did, did, yeah. Um, oh, go on. I got it. I got it. The, the boys haven't heard this story. I'm going to say it again, right? Um, um, near, near, near Paris, near Paris, near Paris, um, some decades ago now, mm. they, um, there was a, there was a, there was a couple of lads. Uh, who were wandering around the ruins of an old abbey, right? And um, they they were, you know, looking around, looking for the crypt. And they didn't have any torches with them. And it was obviously daytime. And one of them was wandering along and tapping on the surface of a stone. And they they decided with a crowbar to break open this crypt. And there was actually these stone steps going down underground. Mm. At which point, a member of the public had noticed them doing this, right? So mm. they went down and into this crypt, and apparently it was watertight, right? Uh, whatever seal, it was watertight. And they went down underground, and this one guy was saying, oh, there's some racking down here. And I can, I, he's, he's, he's feeling around, and he's saying, I can feel bones. And the other guy's going around, going, oh, I can feel bones around, but I can't get my... I can't get my 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 hand around one of the bones, <laughs> right? Mm. The flesh hadn't rotted, <laughs> right? Um, and one of them said, "At the end here, I can feel hair." Mm. This was somebody's head. At which point, a light was being shone down them by the police, who had said that you've just opened. Um, a crypt that had been deliberately sealed because the people buried down here on the shelves had actually died from the plague, mm. which may have still been active. Yeah. Right? right. So that they sealed them off. Mm. They put forensic tents above um, and they had to strip. They had to shower. They had to be left on site in, in beds to make sure that whatever was down there wasn't right. reactivated. Mm. And at which moment they went down underground with flamethrowers and they torched the lot um, and they sealed it for good. Mm. So people, there, there is, people do believe that there is evidence that some of these things do survive. Mm. Mm. Uh, right. Yeah. Margaret, anything else before oh, I go no, on? No, to... that's it. No. Right, David, before we have our break, anything you'd like to say? No, thank you. Um, Peter, um, before uh, before we have a break, uh, we'll have a very short break. Peter? Uh, well, in Cardiff, 400 people died of cholera in 1840. Correct. And that's why yeah. they set up the isolation hospital on Plateau. And it was only, only one cholera victim ever went <clears> there. <throat> oh, a couple of uh, big uh, victims went there, but then only one cholera, as you say. Bubonic plague and others went out there as well. Yeah, well, well, you know, we just chuck Barry people out there from non-stop. Um, <laughs> right, uh, Pat, just just quick before we have a very very quick break. It's going to be a quick break. <coughs> She's not saying anything. You know, Pat always looks gorgeous with a stripy top and a and a bright red hair. You can't hear her. <laughs> She's muted. Oh, oh, we can't hear. I think she went to sleep. <laughs> Sorry. There she um, is. I'll come back next week. Um, arrested. Okay. So I, I'll, I'll shoot off now. And uh, you're going now. Okay, Pat. We'll see you next week. Okay. Bye, all. Bye. Take care. Bye. 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 I'm going. Bye. I'm going at ten o'clock. <laughs> oh, okay. Then. Well, what? Bye, Pat. We'll have a very quick break now. Come on, hurry up, kettle on, and we'll be back in in uh, three minutes. Okay.
Oh, I am. Apparently, Anne's been watching it on YouTube, so that's good. Andy, I think everyone's left us. Mm -hmm. Has David left us as well? No, he just walked down the end of his room. Oh, right. Didn't know who was with us. David lives in an old in, a, in an old cafe, doesn't he? Well, what what he said he lives in? Or was it a restaurant? Mm -hmm. When everybody's back, we'll, we'll crack on. Oh, it's gone cold. Oh, come down here, Margaret. I'll really warm you up. <laughs> I think Pat actually nodded off to sleep. She... She, I'm sure she was asleep there. She was sat yeah. there, her head down. <laughs> and she didn't move. I'm sure she nodded off. Pat used to go to sleep in my lectures in the bloody daytime, and that was when she was in the room. <laughs> That's the effect you had. It is. Is it? The, is this going to be the last of the storms that we're going to have this year? Because I thought we'd actually gone through all this crap. <clears throat> Global warming. Oh, uh, uh, rubbish, Pete. <laughs> Don't get me started on that fictitious nonsense. <laughs> right. Oh, we had global cooling when we had the ice age. Now we've got global warming. Well, that's, that's been in bed with you, Pete. Oh, David's nearly there. We've got Peter. Come on, Pete. Are you going to start again? Or oh, go? Yeah, we're going to start now. We've got to wait. We've we, we just got to start now. Bob, oh, do you know what? We want to be there with David. We want to share his blanket. No, don't bother. All <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, are we all there, ready? Let's go. Yeah, back. yeah. Andy's oh. not. Andy's cat is. David's not sharing his blanket with anyone. Oh. <laughs> right. I hope that I hope that's Shetland wool. Right. Okay. Let's get back to it. Right. So what we're going to do? We've got lots I want us to do in the last bit. I know Anne. Anne said that she's been watching this. Um, oh, good. Anne, Anne's been watching this. So what I want us to do? <clears throat> I want us to wind up um, a little <coughs> bit with um, this other part of the Barrow Diggers, and I just want to so I'll make this last bit of the Barrow Diggers a sort of. Uh, as as interesting um, as possible, and and then then we're going to go on to the other bits that I wanted to do tonight, and and to see what we can do with that. So, 
Okay, let, let's let's sort of uh, we'll, we'll we'll get the screen we'll we'll get me up for a minute and then we'll uh, then we'll try and get some images up there. So here we go. I was once a barrel digger's mate. <laughs> oh shit! What, 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 hang on! What the hell? What's that supposed to mean? I knew a barrel digger. Okay. <laughs> what a guy who dug into barrows. Yeah, quite friendly with him. What, actually prehistoric barrows? Yep. Mind, he was only oh 10. Oh, my God! He was only yeah. 10. <laughs> was he called Carl? He was called Carl. Well, fancy that. And he oh, was he's... just 10. Oh, Peter, I fell for that, didn't I? Right. Lucas he is... Did. You do it every time, yeah. Yes, Lucas's usual <laughs> modus operandi... Was to die, was to drive a trench into a selected barrow, usually from one side, the south side. He would say we dug a wide trench from the south side to the centre, and in some cases beyond the centre. And next, we carried trenches east and west from the south side, at a few feet from the base of the mound. So if if we if I want to do a little bit of a sketch and my interpretation of what he's saying, so if we do this now, this is we do the share screen, right? And we do this, and we we draw a sort of barrow, right? So what what we're talking about with the with the old barrow, the, the, his his criticism of of Cole Hall's excavation method was basically Cole Hall would basically do this, right? And if he didn't find anything, then that's it, right? So our friend, Lucas, is saying, as, as he said here, he would dig a trench from the south side. So here we go, he would dig a trench. And if we get that there, something like that, he would dig a trench from the south side sometimes going a little bit further. And then he might then have a, tr a trench to the east and a trench to the west. Now this, obviously, that, that is going to be a bit more, it's going to be a bit, a little bit better than that. So that's really interesting, the way he's excavating there. Um, and in other words, by digging in this way, yeah, you're getting a sample of the mound, right? Um, which is a, a lot, lot better than the coal hall excavation method because when coal hall missed something, that was it. But what he's saying, what we'll do, we'll keep this section intact and we'll keep this section intact and this section intact. But what we're going to do, we're going to have a little bit more understanding of the rest of the mound to get a few ideas of um, the, the trench. And these latter trenches, um, would would basically try to understand the barrow better. The tre trench system out outlined above revealed the primary burial, if slightly away from the centre, and brought to light a series of other interments in positions where they had not been commonly observed in Wiltshire. So what we're trying to what we're saying is when Cole Hall missed anything, right? He said there's nothing in the mound. In this method what we're doing is tripling our ability to find burials. Even though Cole Hall's excavation method went straight through the trench in a linear direction, this would give an anti-linear perspective. And this would actually lead to the quadrant excavation method, which is in fact still used in archeology span today. Uh -huh. Even so, his diagrammatic plans, if accurate, show that a large area of some barrows he dug still remained untouched. That's what we do today. We don't dig all the barrow. Lucas's father had written to Bateman in August 1855. Remember, uh, Lucas's father was a digger as well, Guernsey, and so was 
uh, Lucas Diggin and Guernsey. Bateman died in 1861, so Bateman had dug a few mounds at this point, giving details of his son's activities at Cow Down. He revealed, and here we go, this is his father about his son. He, my son, is in the midst of Sir Richard Hawes' scene of labours and having free leave to explore over the estates around him. He has commenced his diggings recently. He has explored eight barrows, which must have escaped the Baron's vigilance, as in Baron, as in Sir Hall. So if we if we go away from this now, we don't need this up on there. OK, um, hang on a minute. I've lost where I am again. Um, yeah, go on. Go on, Andy. I've lost where I think, am. Go do, on. You think, do you think Lucas knew that? Um, a lot of prehistoric stuff used the south side as entrances. Or it was just a coincidence that he chose the south side. Um, I, I think I think it could be do to do with lots of reasons. I, I um I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go um hang on a minute, I ne just nearly ended the bloody meeting. Hang on a minute. Um stop here. Um I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to say yes, but I'm also going to say that when you um, when you excavate from the south side, it might have been that the light was better. Yeah, yeah, that's one reason. If you excavate from the south side, um, you might be able to dig against prevailing winds, even though the wind comes from the southwest. But that might be a reason. Um, you might be right in your assumption that 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 predominantly more burials might be from the south side don't know. Very interesting that you asked that question. Anyway, his work is chiefly devoted to the surrounding low barrows near to camps and stations. So in other words, he's, he's interested in maybe the links with settlements as well. Many of these can only be discerned by the eye of the practical digger, and he leaves those elevated mounds to future examinations. He's actually using a terminology, Andy, that we hear today. We're going to leave the rest of the excavations for future examination. And this was 150 years ago. The usual position of the skeletons found is that of lying on one side bent up um, at the legs. So in other words, this is why we used that image earlier on of William Cunnington's, um, which we will now go on to, which we will quickly show you, as in crouched burial, which is not flexed, but crouched. Flex means extended inhumation. Hang on. Um, right. Okay. Gallery. There. And go. Oh, there it is. Let's get to that image again. There we go. So he's saying that um, the, the usual position of a skeleton found is that of lying on one side bent up at the legs with one vase near the head well obviously the vase is near the feet on this one singularly enough that many of these subjects are not 12 inches below the grass of the plain and not yet preserved in nearly perfect state so that's interesting saying that and finally finally of this note and then we'll do a little bit of lucas's own wording and then we'll go on to some of the other things. Lucas was a careful observer. He noted that some of the barrows in the cow down group had been enlarged to accommodate subsequent burials. Only he could find that because of his excavation method. He usually described the materials of the mounds, but did not always give details of their size. That's unfortunate. The enumeration of one burial deposit will serve to show his orderly method and concise description. It refers to a primary interment found in a kist deep inside one barrow. This shortcut grave was three foot, 10 inches long, 15 inches wide and one foot deep. It was almost nine foot from the apex of the mound. And this is his description. And obviously the plans as well. The grave was cylindrical. Oh, I'll start again. <clears throat> Let's do it in his own words. <clears throat> the grave was cylindrical and had been lined with a plaster of powdered chalk about one and a half inches in thickness. The plaster had received the impressions of the bark of a tree and indicated that the bones of the deceased had been placed in a hollow tree trunk, which was deposited in the grave whilst the plaster was still moist. 
It was found that the coffin was only partially beneath the surface level and that it had been covered over with a similar coating of powdered chalk, which, when it dried, retained an arc form over the grave after the wood had decayed. With the bones, which were um, calcined, which, which, you know, which, 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 was, which were burned, um, those of a young person was a horn hammer or mace head about four inches long and one and a half inch wide. And that is a really nice description. Forget about the artifacts. What we're interested in is he records a coffin. He also records um, this sort of lime. He, he gives us some detail that we don't have from earlier excavations. So what we're going to do there, we're going to close on that little bit of the lecture. We've got the other slides to do. I know it's, it's getting late and I know um, we're, we're regularly running over every single week, probably due to the fact that we're putting a lot into this. So what we're going to do, we're going to leave any questions to the end. Um, I know probably, probably, I know Margaret wants to leave, um, but uh, I'm just trying to uh, find my power lead a minute. So bear with me 30 seconds and I will have my power lead in. And the one advantage I've got over you guys is I, I don't rely upon mains electricity because I produce my own. Right, okay, so we're gonna look at this. Now, what it is, um, answer any questions about the rest of the lecture, um, you know, at the end. But I want us to sort of visit this site again. And we, we I'm sure we'll be visiting this site again and again and again. Uh, this is that wonderful sort of, um, um, obelisk um, at Rudston and it was a bit of a question I had a, a few weeks ago and I, what, what I wanted to do uh, was just answer this very very briefly to give you an idea what's at Rudston uh, what is at Rudston well we know that this is there Rudston has evidence of continuous in continuous habitation for thousands of years and is thought to be the oldest continuously inhabited village in England. There are square and round barrows. Mm, square barrows, not told you about them yet, have I? With numerous Neolithic and Bronze Age burials. Unfortunately, many of the excavations that were carried out in the 1800s are, are due, um, didn't record exactly in the same way that we've been talking about today. To the north of the village are something known as the Argham Dykes. And remember, Redston, um, northeast um, of, of England. Um, prehistoric earth banks that are quite difficult to spot nowadays. Of national importance is the Waldgate Cursus believed to be late Neolithic earth banks, which may have been trackways of processional paths. Also discovered were many Iron Age graves to the north of Rudston towards Burton Fleming. Much excavation was carried out there during the 1970s. What we can say about Rudston in brief, and I think this is what one or two of you wanted, was that there are four cursus monuments there. There's the monolith, all the Iron and Bronze Age stuff, and there's the Neolithic landscape of Rudston itself, a Neolithic landscape. An English heritage project is currently being carried out to reassess the 150 identified Cursus monuments in England. Yes, we now have 150 of them in England. When we look at the book by, a book by James Dyer, Ancient Britain, we have nowhere near 150 identified since this book was published. 150 identified cursus monuments in England, and there are others in Scotland and Wales. Initial, initial thoughts are that they were processional routes designed to include the monuments and the events taking place into um, the natural world around them. That's a good interpretation. A possible alternative is that they were routes for young men to, 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 uh, 
routes for young men to traverse as a rite of passage, linking the name back to its William Stukeley's origin, thought of them as, a, as race courses. Final, final note of Rudston, and again, we'll, we, we'll come back to this site. Evidence has also been found of the Roman occupation of the village. So near this stone, there's a Roman site, the remains of a Roman villa, complete with a nine inch, four, nine, let's start again, nine inch, that's small, nine foot by four foot mosaic floor showing Venus bathing, which was uncovered during excavations in the 1930s. This pavement consisting one inch square tesser in blue, red and gray is on display in the uh, museum in Hull, the Hull and East Riding Museum. The lead archeologists were Arthur Woodward and later Kenneth Steer. Various Roman artifacts were also discovered in the 1830s when Thorpe Hall fish ponds were excavated. So I wanted to give you a little bit about Rudston today. And, and this other question that was asked from Adam, right? Um, this is, um, and, and there's a, an image I wanted to show you as well. There was this, this was raised last week. And then a final little thing about emails that Henry has sent us that might interest some of you. Um, the, the question was, Adam asked me the question of, about these, about these false doors, right? And this is at um, Bella's Nap. And, and, I, I've, I've struggled to find any more of these false doors at any other sites, but I, I know that they do exist. I just got to do a bit more research on them. So apologize for that, Adam, but giving you a little bit more idea of these false doors. You can see why it attracts alternative types. So this itself, the impressive frontage engulfs you with two large horns. So one of those on the left and the right are two walls that stick out. Um, Peering closely at these stones through the lichens and crumbling moss, you can see how meticulously they were laid together. Unmoved since those hands placed them 6,000 years before, in the doorway are two portal stones, those uprights there. And the lintel is from later restoration. But despite it drawing you in, this isn't a door. So the whole thing draws you in. It's almost as if it's a doorway, but it's not a doorway. You tap it and you're going to go nowhere, except the ancestors can. There's an original blocking stone in the way. There it is. And even behind, it leads nowhere. Possibly this entrance wasn't for um, actual bodies itself. It may have allowed spirits to pass through. The, the forecourt between the flanks um, which leads you in, could have hosted ceremon ceremonies, bones, including that of an infant, were found beneath the false door. So in other words, um, material was found beneath this, uh, just sort of in front, sort of beneath this. Um, but this was never meant to be a real entrance for the living. It's a real entrance for the ancestors. And when, if you, if you, if you think about this mound and you, you think about um, just, just one point I've got to make, and this is why I've come off my images. Um, if we type in Bella Snap again, um, and we type in Bella, we type in Bella Snap. One, one thing that I would like to say, and obviously every single week is bringing you more and more into this 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 ancient world of ours. When you think about when you think about it. Um, why do you need such a big place to bury people when, in fact, um, only forget about the false door at the front? Um, if, if, you, if you think about this site, maybe if you can see that most of it's taken up by a mound. And can you see that um, if you want to do estimations there, only about 1% is taken up with burial? So the, the, the big question is, why do you need such a big mound? Is it to show off? I don't think it is. I believe it's for your ancestors. That's where your ancestors live. They live in the mound. And obviously this idea of living in the mound and living in that space disappears 
as prehistory moves on because you don't have an, a, a big enough area to actually have these types of monuments for the dead because the dead are competing with the living. However, the dead and the living are also competing with the ancestors because in fact, the ancestors dominate this mound. Before, before I show you this final uh, image, um, we go on to um, finding this. We're going to keep this in the background. And before we mention a little bit about this, and then, then we will call it a night, right? Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want to, I want to read out an email, if I may. And this is this is from our friend Henry, who actually takes part on the Wednesday evening. And and what this is is another email about a find in Ireland, which which we're going to read out now. Um, hang on, I had it a second ago. Right, okay. It, it's about it's about a site known as Down Patrick. I don't have any illustrations for this, but I wanted to read this out. One of the largest prehistoric settlements ever found in Ireland has been uncovered during preparation preparation work for a new school at County Down in Ireland. Archaeologists have excavated the site of the soon to be built uh, Down High School, County Down, in Down Patrick and found evidence of the ancient settlement alongside a graveyard dating from the time of the Irish famine. One of the excavating, one of those excavating the site close to Strangford Road said the Bronze Age site could be the largest prehistoric settlement yet found anywhere on the island. Again, more finds in Ireland. Among, it, um, among items found include a burial urn with cremated remains inside uh, along with a flint arrowhead that is believed to be around 4,000 years old. The archaeologist, Chris Lynn, who worked at the site alongside colleagues from archaeological cons consultants Gahan and Long, said in an interview with the BBC, the prehistoric finds followed after the discovery of a workhouse graveyard dating to around 1847. And this is another point I'd like to make having an ancient graveyard with a modern graveyard. We've mentioned the 1840s a few, few times tonight. So 1847, the graveyard revealed around 950 burials. The people in these burials would have died in the workhouse of various illnesses, such as fever, and we can learn quite a lot from them. Speaking of the much older settlement that was unearthed, we had no idea it was there. It proves that we had urban settlement before the Vikings or early Christians came in. Going back to these burials from 1847, the county down um, high school deputy head Ken Dawson said, the famine era remains will be reinterred. And this is what I like. Listen to what he says. I'm gonna read this in this paragraph in full. Ken Dawson said, the famine era remains will be reinterred on an adjoining piece of land besides the new school. That puts hairs up on the back of my neck with dignity and respect, with plans underway to create a permanent memorial when the new school is complete by 2025. Be, to avoid me getting angry and spoil the lecture. Why is it in Ireland they have the foresight to bury human remains with the respect that they are deserved? And in England and Wales, we don't give a damn for human remains found on our archaeological sites, but in Ireland that they do. And on a final note, needed to read that, needed, probably not at the end. It's got me a little bit angry. Um, finally, this, it was, this, this was, this was um, mentioned last week. And this is, I, I mentioned this in passing last week. It's referred to as the Neolithic ritual axe, Neolithic ritual axe with tiger engravings found in China. Um, and there they are. Um, and this was just, this is really new and I, I won't spend all night on this. So just gonna read through this and we'll call it a day. An excavation of the um, 
Dinja Zhang archaeological site in Wuxi City in eastern China has unearthed a rare stone axe of the Neolithic Yangzhu culture engraved on both sides with tigers, clouds and birds and cloud patterns have been found in the Lanzhu axes before, but this is the first one with a tiger pattern ever found. Discovered during construction work in 2020, the Dinjong site was a settlement of the Lanzhu culture about 4,500 years ago. It covered an estimated five acres on the west bank of the Chashai Lake since August 2022. Archaeologists have excavated a little less than half an acre of it, uncovering multiple cultural layers, multiple cultural layers. We've mentioned that a few times tonight here. A total of 329 stone tools, 73 stone and bone arrowheads, 436 fishing uh, net weights and numerous um, ceramic and jade objects. The tiger axe is the most significant find among these artefacts. Both sides feature the same motifs in different arrangements. One side as a tiger at the top, clouds in the middle and flying birds on the top. Uh, the other side has the flying birds on top, tigers in the middle and clouds on the bottom. The figures are engraved in a fluid and we, we're, if, we, if we look at that there, looks actually better from that, doesn't it? Um, archaeologists believe they were carved with a hard, sharp stone tool. Finally, the axe was found on a sacrificial platform. There are chips and um, areas of wear and tear, but they are minor. This was a util, util this was not, this was not a util, util this was not um, a utility tool. The iconography of the tiger suggests it may have been a symbol representing power. And that is from Neolithic China, and, and and this dates on the last note to 4,500 years ago, uh, which is basically, we're co they're coming to the end of the Neolithic and so are we. So there's a parallel. So we're going to call that a day today and uh, thank you for keeping with us. And I'm very, I'm really happy <laughs> really that you've, that all of you have either stayed with us tonight or um, we actually had um, we, we actually had Anne with us. Uh, Margaret said, sorry, I have to go. Enjoyed it. Bye. Thank you very much, Margaret. So what we're going to do, um, I, I know one of you uh, will will want to go in a moment. So I'm just going to, I've just got a problem with my screen a minute. And there we go. And we're going to close that. And we're going to ask um, David if he's got any questions. No, thank you. Good night, all. Keep right, yourself warm, David. David, and so pleased you've got your arm back. Blimmin' hell. Well done. Uh, right, so who have we got left? We've got, um, actually, to be honest with you, Adam does now look like Peter. <laughs> if you look at Adam, they look the same. Which Peter? Oh, no, stop it! <laughs> Not me. Right, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, then, right. Uh, we, we've got... We've got um, I got um, Andy's hairstyle. Yep. Oh my god. Mi minimalist. Mm. I do the insults. I do the insults, not oh, you sorry. guys. Right. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Th now you can do the insults, Andy. Right. Anything you'd like to say, Andy? No, no, thank you. I just right, I, thank I, you. I, I, apart from I can't get over how many barrows they dug up and you're thinking, God, there can't have been many left. You know, if they're going through so many and how so many different people were going into them and things. It's, it's amazing that any of them have been left. See, mm. when, you, when, you th when you think about it, the um, Reduk um, um, left, uh, Reduk's got 300 plus that we don't know about. Yeah. And that guy, guy by the name of Borlice in Cornwall, right, he, he's actually digging, he, he's the irresponsible one. It's a Cornish guy who's irresponsible in the 1860s, typical. 1885. A typical, um, a typical Celt um, he 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 dug over he dug over two hundred plus mounds that we don't know anything about. Um, Atkinson um, in the late eighteen sixties in Yorkshire that's a hundred. So between the three of those figures, that's that's six hundred mounds that we have no idea about. Merryweather could have been a hundred. We don't yeah. know. We have got nothing about and, that. And and the other ones who didn't bother to record anything, you know. 
Yeah, it's exactly, exactly. Uh, I, I actually, what I might do when when I when I've got it available, I will show you my my original plan of the only excavation at a certain burial mound in Barry. Right, okay. Um, <laughs> It's it, it's actually it's actually a really good plan, and uh, I, I shocked myself myself. Anyway, um, right, okay, yep. Peter, anything you want to say? Uh, no, no. Um, it's just uh, other than uh, we didn't have a. I don't think we have barrow diggers per se on Dartmoor, but I know that the a certain antiquarian group, uh, in their terminology, cleared something like. Uh, a hundred round uh, round houses in a very short space of time. Fingers down um, my throat, please. Oh god. Yeah. Right. Okay. Let's move on from that sadness. They're ah, they're not barrows. We don't care about them. No. Um, right. <laughs> uh, just houses, huts. Just, just huts. Just huts. Just, just, just evidence of human occupation. Pot regions. Nothing really. Yeah. People just live there. Right. Okay then. Adam, give it, give it to us, man. Nothing to add to that, Cole. Thank you very much, Doug. You enjoyed that, yeah. Good, excellent. Yeah, thank you. Right. So, what what we're what we're going to do? Um, uh, we're going to um, we're, we're going to we're going to call this a night. And um, you know, if anyone wanted to chat afterwards, then uh, then they're welcome. Elise is online again. Great lecture. Enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elise. Um, and if there's no other questions, uh, we will be doing a lot more next week. And off the part three. Thank you. Off the part three. Okay, then I'm going to say good night to Andy, Adam, Peter, Peter, and Adam, and Peter and Adam again. Right. Care, Andy. Thank uh, you very Peter. much, guys. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye bye. No night. No night. No night. No night. Well, it's just me and you, Elise, and whoever else is online. Thanks for joining us tonight. Great to have you all on board. Really appreciate your support. And um, yes, and, and I'm just thinking, um, I should have mentioned this, but people online, if 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 I did um, a live just for um, people on YouTube, just sort of me muttering, just chatting on YouTube, what would be the best night to do it? And just to get it out there, maybe, if you've got any ideas, put it there now. So I'm going to, um, I'm just going to um, just leave that to settle a minute if anyone's got any points online, because it's a little bit behind. And uh, that's it. So I've got to wait till this yellow thing appears on that screen, and then I know that you've known, and we know we know you know you know, right? And that's it. Can zip it behind, and that's the way it is. So um, yes, there you go. And I'm going to write thank you. Thank you for joining us. And my pleasure. Right, I'm going to call it night now. No, no, guys. No, no, see you again. Thank you very much. And I'm just going to look at my chat and you, Elise, as well. Sorry, I have to go. Enjoyed it. Bye. That was Margaret. Right. Sorry, have to go. Enjoyed it. Bye. There we go. Bang. There's a chat. People using the chat box. Anyway, no, no, folks. No, no. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you very much for your support.